Hello everyone, welcome to the fourth episode of Dharma Conversations. In the last episode, we spoke to Sandeep Balakrishna on the advent of media itself. How did media originate in India? How did it evolve? And eventually become the cesspool that we now know as Latin's media. The media, as we saw in that conversation and insights from Sandeep, did extensive damage to the narratives and to multiple generations that grew up on the printed word actually believed what was uh, narrated in those times. This brings us to the next uh, topic which we will start in this episode and it will end up being a multi-part series as the scope of the subject is vast. Recently, I think it was yesterday that Prime Minister inaugurated the statue of the Ahom warrior Lachit Gorfukan in Assam. Now, I for once did not uh, read about him in my growing up years through the school curriculum. So, who defined history for us? What was the history that was fed to us? Was it accurate? If a general who thwarted Mughal invaders for 16 times and prevented the Northeast from getting balkanized was not covered in history, then it does pose a question mark on what the history that we read, what was it all about? So with historians like Sandhi who spend their lifetime devoting with integrity to finding out genuine aspects of history that was suppressed and slanted, I think it's time we dwell into history of history itself and who better to do it with than Sandhi. So starting this episode, we will cover in a multi-part series the history of history, what makes for history writing, who actually qualifies to be a historian. Get into the historians or the historians who distorted history for us for generations and actually rendered us with the subjugation complex. And India is coming out of it over the last few years because genuine uh, accomplished warriors, genuine accomplished contributors are now coming to the fore like Lachit Borfu Khan. For, for that matter, Rani Abakka and Ulal. Nobody had heard about it until somebody else documented it. So we'll get into these details in each passing episode. Uh, this will be a fascinating study of history itself and also bring to fore uh, the exposés that people like Sandeep have done on these historians who have peddled agendas in the garb of uh, being in the academia. And uh, this series will therefore form a bulwark or an antidote against all the narratives which have been packaged as history and fed to us. So to my mind, this is an important exercise to do and let's bring it to the fore of Sandeep Bala. Hi Sandeep. It's good to be back with you again for the fourth episode of Dharma Conversations. Like I mentioned, uh, it is thanks to work that has been done by historians like you that some of us, for that matter, many of us have discovered that what we consumed as history, primarily through school curricula, uh, excluded a, a lot of uh, what uh, many of our ancestors accomplished by willful design. And uh, we'll get to that part on uh, who did that and why uh, as we progress in the conversation of this first of the multi-part series. Uh, before we get into any of that, uh, what I want to begin with is by asking you, there are many people who peddle or qualify them or who label themselves as historians. And history is not an easy subject. It needs a lot of uh, rigor and analysis uh, and devotion to you know, come up with a genuine uh, point of view and chronicle facts. What is history writing by itself? Is is there, is there, what qualifies uh, as history writing? Can we begin with that in the first place? Then we'll go to the other aspects. Sure. Uh, thanks, Parag. Uh, what qualifies as history writing? You know, the simplest definition in today's context, today meaning in the last, uh, over the history of the last, say, 200, 300 years, yesterday's newspaper, is history. Meaning, there is history and there is something called a philosophy of history. And you can't separate the two. And uh, a very wise ancient Greek uh, uh, philosopher who was also a historian, you know, defined history very memorably. He said that history is philosophy teaching through examples. History is philosophy teaching through examples. Yes. So, Primarily, if you delve into in-depth into any subject, be it history, law or even pure philosophy, you will end up in philosophy. Now, there's this famous anecdote about Srinivas and Ramanujam. He said, God talks to me through numbers. You know, the Brahman, he talks to me through numbers. So what does it indicate? That when you go in-depth into any subject, you will reach philosophy. There is no escaping it. So this is why, you know, this is one of the uh, ways in which we, we can understand what, what uh, 
that Greek philosopher said that history is philosophy teaching by examples, meaning and the quest of philosophy is the quest for truth. And therefore history by corollary is... Its most profound definition of history is a search for truth. It is a quest for, uh, for truth. In terms of, you know, in whatever, let's, let's break down history into many branches. So let's take the example of the name of a village, for example. You begin digging into the history of, the, of that particular village. What is the first place you will start? So history occurs in a context, in a spatio-temporal context, meaning it has a time and a place. Now in this example of this village, what is the first thing you begin with? You begin with its name, you begin with its location and then you begin with the present because your investigation begins at a present moment, right? And then you trace its antiquity. How did it get its name? When did it, you know, uh, when did it get its present name? For example, Bengaluru. Many people, you know, call it the most familiar name is Bendakalu. So, and then you trace the antiquity of that village to the earliest available record of when it was founded or established in that place, and all the events that surrounded that village. Now, I just gave you the example of uh, Bengaluru. Uh, the anglicized uh, form of uh, Bengaluru is Bangalore. So the earliest reference to the name of Bengaluru allegedly comes from Bindakaluru, all, although there are some you know, differences in the historical community as to what the original name of Bengaluru was. So this is how you begin to uh, an investigation into history. And it is <coughs> In, in, in very rare cases, again, history is an ongoing process. There is no such thing as a final word. In most cases, whatever is available now about a particular event or a person or a place uh, or a dynasty, whatever has been the information available about it till now, which is undisputable can be regarded as the historical truth of that person, place, event, dynasty, empire. So in that sense also, history is again a continuous quest for truth. Now there are two things out here. There are something called settled historical truths. For example, the biological example is a settled truth. The fact that Aurangzeb was the biological son of Shah Jahan. The fact that Aurangzeb usurped power on a certain year and then left this world on a certain year. These are settled truths which nobody can dispute. Now what he did during his reign, what impact it had, what his motivations were, all these things begin initially as speculations. And then as the body of information about it begins growing, new evidence comes out. All these will also eventually attain the status of a settled truth. For example, in Aurangzeb example, the fact that he demolished Kashi Vishwanath's temple is an incontrovertible historical, settled historical truth. This is why you say, you know, history is philosophy teaching through examples. Now, what are the examples that Aurangzeb has set? And what is the philosophy it teaches you? That bigotry is bad. That, That's what it teaches. That expansiveness of the heart, mm. tolerance, magnanimity, a sense of profundity in your behavior, in your conduct, character, these things fall almost within the realm of philosophy. You cannot separate these elements from history and pretend that it is still history. So what, what strikes me is eventually it is the un impeachable quest for truth. Yes. And it's an honest quest for truth. Honest quest for truth. Meaning you set aside your bias because the historian or the researcher who is doing, you know, who is writing or investigating history is also a product of several factors. The place of his birth, his immediate family circumstances, his upbringing, his uh, religious beliefs, 
his external influences, all these play a very, very big but a subconscious role. When he or she is trying to, uh, I don't want to use the word interpret, but for the sake of convenience, when this historian is trying to interpret or understand what these mass of facts are telling him. To my mind, history is an extremely noble discipline which equally rubs shoulder with philosophy, uh, rubs shoulders with philosophy. Not only is it noble, the impact of history mm. on every coming generation, mm. if it is not truthful, mm. uh, ca can have severe consequences and we'll, we'll yes. probably talk about some of them. So history ideally should never be tampered with at all, yes. which, uh, mm. which uh, unfortunately seems to be, yeah, has, which have, to be the case. Come to that. Yeah. Now just to take this thread of, uh, uh, you know, history as philosophy, the traditional Indian view of history is itihasa which means iti plus hasa. It happened thus, meaning that it literally happened thus. And in our tradition, only Ramayana and Mahabharata and to some extent even Puranas, they are regarded as itihasas. Meaning, every single incident that happened in Ramayana and Mahabharata, our tradition believes it to be the literal truth. Now, when you say that, you know, Hanuman, when you, when you kind of, you know, put it in realistic dimensions. When you say, for example, that Hanuman built, you know, was involved in, uh, he burnt Lanka or he flew over this, uh, over the Indian Ocean, landed in Sri Lanka or he went to, uh, he brought the Sanjeevani Parvat on his shoulder. When you bring it down to the literal domain, they sound uh, unbelievable. Remember, Hanuman is a monkey and Hanuman is a monkey who talks, who has magical powers, who has extraordinary valor. Still, although he is a monkey, how does our tradition recognize him? It recognizes him, uh, recognizes him as an ansh or an element of Shiva. Hanuman is worshipped as a deity, as Bhagavan. And when you say monkey, the word for uh, monkey in Sanskrit is Kapi. We don't call him Kapi, we call him Kapisha. You have this in uh, Ramcharit Manas, for example. Jai Kapish. Hmm, Jai Kapish, correct. Right. So, how do you reconcile? Now, in the, the so-called uh, modern mind of Hindus as well, mostly Hindus, it cannot reconcile this. Because when you reduce everything, when you bring everything down to the literal plane, what happens? You lose philosophy. In that history, you lose philosophy. Why is he worshipped? The essence. Yeah, why is he worshipped? And why does Ramayana, at the same time, Ramayana is regarded as a, is simultaneously regarded as many things. One, it is a fantastic story. Two, it is the world's first epic. Three, it is a Parayana Grantha, meaning it is a sacred work. Four, uh, you know, it has uh, enough and more material for multiple adaptations, music, dance, lyric, you know, every, uh, you know, different renditions of the Ramayana. Now, this, it is also history. Now, why does this happen? How do you reconcile this, this Itihasa with history? When you get so, when that, you say Itihasa with history, are you talking about Indian, uh, the Bharatiya view and the Western view? view? Oh, okay. Bharatiya view contrasted with the West. Okay. Now, when you call it Itihasa in our uh, tradition, meaning literally it happened thus Lanka was burnt, uh, Maricha, the Rakshasa, Maricha, he took the form of a, a, a golden deer. You know, you cannot believe this in the literal plane. But for the longest time, our people believe these things as literal truths. Okay, they believed that Sri Ramachandra was an avatar of Vishnu. It was not subject to even question. So, how do you reconcile this with the history that is defined by the West? This literalist versus this uh, allegedly fantastic uh, uh, notion of itihasa. You can reconcile that by regarding history as a value as contrasted from fact. Professor M. Hiriyanna, one of the foremost philosophers 
of the last century he has given an extraordinary uh, uh, an analogy to illustrate the difference between what is fact and value water for example is a fact but which nobody can falsify H2O that is a chemical composition of water that is a fact what is also a fact is the human thirst right we all meet we you know we we get water we take water for granted thirst doesn't even strike you at a conscious level so thirst is also a fact water is also a fact a person who's thirsty finds no water you know in the immediate vicinity then you have another person who has water and without this thirsty person asking for it if person b gives the water and quenches his thirst that is a value okay that's perspective so between value it, it is a value that you know i see you are thirsty and i have water i have two choices i can keep the water with me let you go thirsty but because i recognize that your thirst is the same as mine and therefore i wish to quench it to you hmm. so that becomes a value right all right so that is why for the longest time in our culture there was a, a widespread belief that if you don't give water to a thirsty person you will be born as a lizard in your next birth not too many people know this, this and, is, and the philosophy behind this would this, be to this, instill values yeah so this is how you translate philosophy into practical doable action so why these are this is also why across india <clears throat> when a guest comes or a stranger <clears throat> comes to your home the first thing you, you ask, do is yes. to offer water would you like some water yes so it stems from that it value stems system from that value system which is seeped in our dna fire is another example as a value fire lights lamps before you know your gods it illuminates your home or it burns your home is the application in the end it is a application in the hands of an invader fire is used to destroy in the hands of builders of culture and civilization it is used to illuminate both you know in the physical realm and in the realm of knowledge so but by that standard our conception of itihasa history is a value the events that occur in ramayana the episodes that occur in mahabharata they basically convey value they are used as vehicles to convey lasting profound eternal values so even in the uh, i know even like, with mahabharata essentially i mean you can view it in 100 different you know no infinite number of ways if you view it in the using the frame of uh, framework of politics it is the greatest political work epic ever written absolutely and who are the characters in the epic finally the central if you you know distill it to the central thing it is also politics that happens within the same bloodline it is a war between cousins so and around these things through the episodes through the incidents through characters uh, you know that occur in the mahabharata the message of values the you know uh, an entire value system is conveyed without that without the background of mahabharata bhagavad gita if you read it as a stand alone work it definitely has its merit but if you contextualize it within mahabharata it opens an entirely different uh, 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 world of insights so at this level you have to understand history etymology of history as bharat sees it mm. as opposed to mm. the western world mm. there is such a deep rooted uh, ethos and value system that guides history uh, writing mm. it is not just chronicling of you know facts figures and uh, yeah, mm. episodes mm. so it it has a purpose yes. it has a purpose yes. while truth remains the overarching purpose yes the purpose is to impart value yeah ideally it should be that but uh, you know there is a famous saying the trajectory of uh, what is known as history writing uh, was beautifully said there is a lovely quote about that which says that the first lesson of history is uh, not to forget politics and the first lesson of politics is to forget history is to forget history i mean it's a whole universe in itself it merits a 
philosophical study and then you know, uh, I'm repeating this but it is it is a fundamental point which bears repetition multiple times because of the manner in which history as a discipline has evolved uh, especially over the last uh, hundred years so you both, say evolved both, both in India and in the West so evolved in a positive sense no both in the positive and in the uh, in the negative sense okay. both both within and outside well, throughout the world does this herald well or this whatever transpired in the last hundred years mm. versus uh, again mm. let's say if you use the uh, barometer of truth pursuit mm. pursuit of truth eternal pursuit of truth and values mm. Mm. how how true has it held to that this evolution in the last hundred years ah that's a very nice question even for this we need a slight uh, detour into history what is known as history now now matlab over oh, the last uh, 300 350 years it uh, brings us back or it takes us back again to something that we had discussed in the previous episode about the advent of printing press the first histories that were written and widely disseminated were made possible precisely due to printing until then both history writing and religious writing any other form of you know storing and disseminating knowledge was largely done uh, you know manually by writing on you know uh, parchment on you know leaves barks of trees and you know date leaves palm leaves this kind of thing so the medium was quite fragile and it was not con conducive for you know long periods of preservation so they had to uh, you know writing itself was a very painful and laborious too many people understand this now after printing that era was over history could be disseminated on a mass scale thanks to printing it also uh, gave rise to several other uh, uh, by products the guy who writes it first you know there's a famous saying that any argument any verbal argument is won by the guy who lands the first punch on your nose mike tyson famously said this so when they began writing history the west europe especially when they began writing history they did multiple things at the same time one obviously the first of the histories even until the 1940s most histories related to say britain or france or italy or germany it was about glorifying their own race their own people their conquests and uh, you know how great they are and how god has given them a certain uh, uh, mandate on this earth things like this self flattering histories this was being propagated on a very uh, rapid scale and that kind of paved the foundation laid the foundation for much of what followed um, uh, eventually in the realm of history if you read all these uh, 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 16th century 17th century british histories you'll be dumbfounded what today you call as objective history and unbiased and unprejudiced history almost every page would have 50 lines of pure bias but they also gave context today when you read them they give us context of the society of the culture of the belief systems of you know even mundane things like uh, dressing food diet uh, social structures these are all valuable information and for us today reading those books they become our primary source so it perpetuates not necessarily yeah. in the best possible manner not necessarily i mean that is debatable we won't get into that hmm. now what happened as a result of that is that the rest of the world especially uh, india for the rest of the world especially for india and because like i said you know in the last uh, episode printing came centuries after it was invented in europe so as a result we were forced to catch up you know see the technology gap yeah. in in the realm of time see the you know you're talking in centuries not in terms of decades so by 19th century we we had the first printing press in hyderabad one printing machine in hyderabad now so that is what about 300 years minimum the lag you know, behind the lag between the time lag yeah. you know behind and then the books they brought in here hello not not, not just the british i mean they were competing powers in india dutch portuguese french british so even danish people had come here danish danish very brief uh, period 
the books they brought with them which we began to read we believe that we believe whatever is written in them to be true meaning as a true history of those people look at the levels at which this gap plays out and on the other side rather rather on a parallel track colonialists were extremely good chroniclers detailed chronicles you have to read those uh, uh, documents especially you know things like travel logs and memoirs written by bureaucrats and physicians of that time roughly from jahangir's period onwards you should read them they will describe even the even the color even the tinge of a color of a leaf in, vivid vivid and vivid in the outskirts of for example burhanpur so this is the length at which they have gone and they would transmit this knowledge they were not writing for indians for their they were writing back for home. their home countries based on which you know those fellows uh, you know framed their whatever business policy political policy towards india now all these play a big role in understanding for us as indians in understanding our own past these like you know one uh, common phrase in history is that god and historical truth lies in the details so it could be something as innocuous as uh, say shah jahan during sunset it could be as innocuous as that but when you set it in the larger historical context of the mughal rule or or the muslim history of india man so when you set these things in the larger historical context that is when you will know there is a reason why he stood there so by itself by itself it might not mean anything as a you know when you read it without context you you might skip that line so when you say it is a quest for truth you bring, you know these are all the factors that come into play so uh, what what strikes me is that the intent from their lens whoever was uh, coming into india was to paint a vivid picture of what they were experiencing seeing trans- what was transpiring to so people back home and also perhaps preserve these mm. things of posterity mm. like it began with lachit borpo khan mm. Uh, mm. i mean such a great ancestor of ours who single handedly you know thwarted the invasion of mughals multiple times is getting his due now uh, i'd like to hear from you or if you talk to us a little about how was it that right after independence mm. history writing itself became where the intent itself was uh, dubious uh, uh, okay now that you you know frame it that way we have to transport ourselves back to that time and uh, which is post independence the tradition of history writing or what is known as uh, chronicles for the longest time these were called chronicles not history as we understand it today the tradition of chronicling or what they call as uh, tarikh that has been the strongest and the most prolonged in the muslim world so oh, is that so yes okay. why because the history of islam it begins at a specific year the islamic calendar begins with i think the flight of muhammad from uh, mecca to madina the ah they they use a word ah meaning al hijri or al hijra it is al hijra yeah so the so it begins at a specific year and it revolves entirely uh, you know around the life of prophet because it is a conquering religion it is a imperialistic religion every victory that islam has achieved outside arabia was meticulously documented you have literally hundreds and hundreds of chroniclers who begin invariably begin their work on history for example barani is known as one of the greatest chroniclers uh, 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 of the in the muslim world and rightly so for different reasons now including barani all of them begin their histories with the origin of islam in this world and then tracing the life of prophet muhammad is victory so they, it starts from there starts from there and then it begins to it begins to document all the successes of islam within india from uh, you know muhammad bin qasim all the way till 
Barani wrote the history of both uh, the Khalji dynasty and uh, Tughlaq dynasty all the way till his own time. And those chronicles, they, I mean, their central goal is the glorification of Islam. Exactly. So the, the pursuit was I'll not for truth. That. I'll come to that. The central goal is the glorification of Islam and the and the abuse of what they call whom they call kafirs. I've done a four-part series on Dharma Dispatch, the psyche of a medieval Muslim chronicle, their mindset, their motivation for writing the writing in a manner they did. The value of these chronicles for us is that they give a first-hand picture of the society of the period, behavior pattern of a sultan or a nawab or you know nizam or whoever and uh, you know the social system that prevailed during the life of the chronicle and so on very valuable now when you filter out all the bigotry and uh, you know glorification and other things you get a reasonably accurate and truthful picture of that period now you transport yourself back to that period they were not writing history, what we understand as history today the same thing applies even with the Christians who came from Europe. Remember that both Columbus, he was a pirate essentially, both Columbus and Vasco da Gama and, and, and the conquest of Asia and America began with Portugal and Spain. Of Asia? Yeah, essentially. I mean they set the seeds when they discovered, when Portuguese discovered, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, Vasco da Gama discovered the uh, sea route to India. Now, when those people came here, some of them, they, some of the conquerors, they themselves wrote their memoirs. Others who came in their team comprised various classes of people like merchants, doctors, chaplains, Jesuits. So the Jesuits, for example, they left behind copious chronicles, not, not just Portuguese, but across the board, French, Portuguese, Italians, uh, you know, uh, even the British, they have left behind just the number of chronicles. If you put them all in one place, it is enough to occupy 10 large libraries. That is the amount of documentation they have, uh, you know, written. Like uh, the Islamic chroniclers, even the Christian clergy, cutting across denominations, they did not pretend to write any history. They were describing their contemporary period in which they travelled to India and other places in the world. So these are not histories in the strict sense of the term. It is like writing a diary, right. you, right. which, which became chronicles Correct. and then… And they never pretended that they were they historians. Were documenting history. They never pretended that they were historians. Yes. Now we have to make this very, very fundamental distinction clear. So this discipline of, uh, uh, not discipline, this transition or evolution from writing chronicles to examining chronicles and reconstructing the past which became known as the academic discipline of history. That transition, that evolution is very important and even until, uh, for example, Eliot and Dowson, they, they, I mean, they have done phenomenal service with due respect to their scholarship and with due skepticism about their bigotry. They have reconstructed the entire Muslim period of India in about 10 volumes, 10 or 11 volumes. History of India told by its own historians. So they, they cover the entire Islamic history of India, all from primary sources. The monumental work, it was a path-breaking work. And Eliot and Dowson, were imperialists and racists to the core. You should read their introductions to most of the volumes in which they clearly say, because they are writing the uh, you know Muslim history of India, they clearly say that we as British people, we are doing you Indians a favour, a service by writing this. Without the benevolent uh, intervention of uh, uh, kind-hearted uh, race of Britons, the Hindus of India would still be suffering under, uh, uh, you know, the bigoted and cruel uh, Islamic rule. They write this. So they saw themselves as liberators yes, of Islamic yes, oppression. They, they write this. And even, even well until the early part of the 20th century when uh, history writing had emerged as a full-fledged objective discipline, a standalone discipline. Even in the early part of the 20th century, you read those journals and history works written about India, 
<coughs> primarily by the British. What do they say? How do they view uh, Hindu dharma and its various offshoots and practices? They make no pretense of hiding their aversion towards what they call as dirty ideal, uh, idol worship. <laughs> that bigotry, you know, there's no objectivity there. They take this as granted. For example, at the end of every Dana Shasana or inscription of, uh, you know, proclaiming a grant of a land or village or any service to a temple done, it was a practice to issue grants. <laughs> and at the end of the grant, there was this mandatory shloka which basically said Svadattam va paradattam va yohareta vasundhara shashti varsha sahasrani vishtayam jayate krimi It's a very very profound verse and it exhibits the value system by which our society lived the ideals which our ancestors upheld What it basically means is that any grant given either by the individual himself or which had already been given by another person in the past any such grant any such donation if another person tries to forcibly smash it or usurp it or destroy it will be born in the next janma as a worm in a drainage and he will suffer in that stage for 60,000 years. Shashti Varsha Sahasrani Vishtayam Jayate Krimi Krimi worm insect. So what does this show? So, I mean it's it's evident the morals and the ethics uh, it's all evident. Now why I mentioned this? I took this as a random example. It illustrates you know the sharp contrast between how they regarded these uh, uh, verses our inscriptions and how we regarded them. At the end of such inscriptions, the Western writers who deciphered those inscriptions, they would just conclude with one line. The usual imprecatory verses follow or the imprecatory usual imprecatory verse. lines follow. They do not mention the value which is inherent in that verse. Because, because the lens and mindset is not, is not value based. Exactly. exactly. So, you have, you know, almost a polar opposite value system. So, given this background, what objectivity will remain or can we expect from such histories? I mean, look, you can justify, you know, their way of thinking as, I mean, they, they, they looked at even today. Western writing on Hindu history especially is uh, still in the colonial, uh, uh, you know, imbued with the colonial mindset because they still view themselves as the race of people who conquered, subjugated and ruled over Indians, meaning mostly Hindus. So that is the same mindset, unless you change this mindset, you can't expect much uh, uh, valuable history writing from that side. But now, would you call this as fabricated or false history? No. no. Their interpretations, whatever that, that aside, they were basing their uh, decoding of our uh, of our inscriptions of our history of our primary sources based on their cultural background. And it would be difficult for them yeah. to grasp the yeah. deep rooted ethos behind. Correct. It. See, because other thing is when they saw when they studied our culture, history, and uh, you know heritage uh, and all our traditions, they did so with the attitude not just of a conqueror, with the attitude of a person studying a fossil, you know, uh, a scientist, uh, uh, a zoologist who goes into the lab and cuts open animals. So instead of a live dharmic continuous This state. is a living tradition. You know, I mean, this is incredible when I think of it, Parag. They had Hindus living all around them. They, they watched their, they, you know, they, they had contact with that society, although they didn't mingle with it. They knew how the society worked, what its belief systems were, you know, how they went to temples every day, they went to, you know, their uh, Tirthyatras, they knew this. But somehow, that knowledge, that awareness escaped them when they were studying India's history. India's past is not a dead past, it is a continuum. They forgot this fundamental point and so, 
to that extent they really missed up our uh, you know uh, the, the the approach that itself was flawed so the product was also missed up although you know uh, there were some honest scholars with their limitations they <coughs> did not pretend to know more than what they did but that number is very very few but that apart you can't call this objective uh, history writing now one i'll take a random example how this works europe emerged from the christian darkness of an entire millennium it could emerge the renaissance could happen only because europe itself rejected christianity so the moment it rejected christianity what happened was that it had no base to stand on so the stalwarts of the european renaissance which began in 15th century the stalwarts of that period they did not have when they rejected christianity they did not have any roots so they looked hard and you know you know spent a lot of uh, effort and they found that our roots lie in ancient greece and rome pre christian greece and rome oh is that so yes so without which which has nothing to do with christianity without, yeah so you know rome classical rome what they call as pagan rome or pagan rome was killed by christianity so how do you recover it so they began to find their heroes and their roots there so like islam christianity also destroyed the previous footprints wherever yeah, it went yeah. islam is taken uh, it's inspired by christianity uh, the methods most, methods some, are different no it's the most recent abrahamic religion but we are digressing so when europe discovered its pre christian uh, classical past in greece and rome it began to appropriate their heroes now they brought the same approach their approach to studying you know these uh, uh, pre christian uh, european cultures to study india's past thinking that you know they assume that because we have conquered india remember the sun never sets on the british empire yeah. remember that yes so they had out of this arrogance they thought that you know anyway we've conquered uh, india and our rule will go on forever so hindu culture hindu civilization is a dead civilization in fact the british declared it gave uh, you know i mean it's so unfortunate uh, parag that the british on basis of no evidence declared that sanskrit was a dead language and what are the compulsion to declare it dead at all obviously no if you have to declare sanskrit as a dead language look at the benefits that lacu one it will artificially prove that hindu culture and civilization has become extinct two because it will justify their colonialism the fiction the fabrication that british brought culture and civilization to hindus yeah so sanskrit is uh, eliminated yeah then the whole so rich evidence benefits, no? yeah okay so this is the approach they so got done very smartly i would say yeah this is very smart i mean you have to give it to them that what two uh, 250 years of british colonialism and conquest of india rather produce some extraordinarily talented people in all fields in britain but uh, for the most part they used it to destroy india and this kind of history colonial uh, history was prescribed it was compiled you know it was prescribed as reading material and a syllabus for british aspiring to become civil servants in india for the longest time the ics was not open to indians this sort of history this sort of cultural study they became prescribed uh, textbooks for those fellows out there the ruling class <coughs> and even a lot of these uh, higher bureaucrats in the east india company it's a long history so now the same history was fed to indians who either studied there you know subhash chandra bose studied to uh, become a civil servant so did shri aurobindo and they consumed he, this they consumed this about their own country it was also taught to indians in especially in universities higher education not so much <coughs> at the primary level higher education when you enrolled in the university you were uh, caught into that that narrative on the global scale all these people like uh, you know uh, mill and other people elfinstone all those fellows their uh, 
colonial narratives also traveled across the Atlantic to the US. So this is the basis of much of the Western Hemisphere's view about India. This nonsense is even today taught in all academies of higher education in the United States. This is after colonialism was thoroughly dismantled in 1947. India was the first country to get freedom. And it continues to be yeah. peddled that way. So this it is incredible. This is I mean this is a this is both an unprecedented and an unparalleled hoax in the history of human civilization. It's still continuing. Now something else also happened around the same time. One class of uh, uh, Indians who were educated in British methods in the university system, they, when they began to read, especially at the uh, post-doctoral level, when they began to read these uh, uh, biases, this kind of, you know, totally one-sided supremacist narratives, they began questioning them. So this, you know, this class of people was populated by uh, Swami Vivekananda, for example. I mean, he didn't write any history books, but his, you look at his complete works, you know his caliber, you know the sweep and his uh, range of his erudition on uh, different subjects. So, Swami Vivekananda, Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, uh, Ashutosh Mukherjee, Shama Prasad Mukherjee's father. So, one entire batch of uh, 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 Exemplary scholars, I mean multifaceted polyglots, polymaths, that is a period I call as the period of the new Indian renaissance. So that is a century that began in the second half of the 19th century and ended after Nawab Nehru became all powerful. Ironical. We will explore these themes in the coming episodes. Now, yeah. So, uh, when... You say that Europe rejected Christianity and they started searching for their hmm. um, genuine uh, ancestry and heroes and hmm. and they traced it to Greece and Rome, uh, so Roman Empire, hmm. and started to appropriate. So, similarly, w what I began with was similarly, I mean, taking the same context or the same perspective, when... India got independence. Mm. Uh, while I know we'll cover some of, uh, some other aspects in detail in subsequent conversations, the quest from our side, mm. from our historians, should have been to because you said history that was fed to the British is also taught to Indians in certain echelons, right? So the quest should have been for the same. The same quest should have applied. Mm. Ingeniously, it should have been fed that mm. look, let's go back to our true roots. Mm. This is not what this is what we're consuming is not our history. Mm. But that did not happen, right? Which are people like you have... You have actually moved ahead. I was coming to that. I was on the point of the new Indian Renaissance. So entirely homegrown scholars who were also trained in the English method, in the European method of uh, uh, what they call uh, as history, which has a lot of uh, uh, merits, uh, especially when you... <clears throat> in the area of, of, of searching for hard data, primary sources, this kind of thing. And uh, one of the great things that uh, British did in India in this field was the introduction of uh, archaeology, a systematic development of epigraphy, numismatics and allied fields. That is something we don't find in our past, in our knowledge system. So we have to you know, give credit where it is due. What they did with it, how they interpreted, they interpreted it, that is a different subject. But these scholars, these stalwarts of the Indian Renaissance, who were trained in that mold, but who were fiercely culturally rooted, they said, Dekho, ye, this William Jones, ye ke galat likh hai. so they began rebutting them. So they saw through that and they started saw through that very rebutting. Easily. And these were no ordinary people, sir. So let me take a random name of the, just to illustrate the caliber and the prowess of these stalwarts of uh, New Indian Renaissance. M. Govindapai. He hailed from, uh, you know, a village near Mangalore. And this man, I mean, where do I begin? He knew 24 languages. New meaning not just to read and write and understand. He could compose poetry. For the longest time, 
the mark of a cultured and a truly literate man was a mastery over composing poetry because that is the toughest thing to do in any language especially in indian languages now m govinda pai was of this caliber 24 languages all indian languages he knew japanese and this was german this was just uh, he died quite recently i think about uh, early 80s or late 70s if i'm not mistaken as recent as that. recent as that he knew he had mastered inscriptions basically epigraphy he could defy, decipher archaeological finds primary sources written in obscure languages very old forms of uh, languages could be you know prakrit pali kannada tamil telugu marathi gujarati you know you know he would deliver impromptu speeches on any topic related to literature history culture drama so this was a caliber now i recently read recently matlab 3 4 years back read one uh, paper a scholarly paper that he had written on a little known dynasty in karnataka called the punnata dynasty say that again punnata punnata, punnata dynasty punnata dynasty they had their capital in a village near kabini today that has become a resort okay in that area that was their capital a very obscure short lived dynasty this man traces their entire genealogy you know it is a master class in how you should conduct a historical investigation and how you should arrive at reasonably truthful conclusions based entirely on the currently available evidence this was a caliber so he could butt heads with the you know so called uh, scientific historians of his uh, era and then you have someone like jadunath sarkar till date if you want to uh, you know venture into the field of writing about aurangzeb you cannot surpass him and you have these jokers like you know what is that audrey trushkiet uh, yeah. uh, uh, someone you know she flatters herself that she is the last uh, authority on aurangzeb no after he died new evidence new documentation might have come out about regarding aurangzeb but that does not mean that you are somehow better because you found this new new material no? yeah it's not so his work stands it, yeah his work stands yeah it's exemplary and just to write about aurangzeb he dedicated 25 years of his life that's a commitment and today you know we are talking about things like uh, short attention span attention deficit disorder this man spent 25 years of his life on aurangzeb 10 years of his life on shivaji 15 years of his life on the later moguls meaning mogal dynasty after aurangzeb you know and these are himalayan masters in every sense now to write about aurangzeb most of the material or even about mogal empire most of the material is in farsi persian and some of a bulk of that material he discovered it for the first time in his quest yes for the first time he discovered some farmans in in an underground library in a jain monastery meaning he traveled there in those days you know you couldn't just take a flight from bangalore to jaipur or he put in this kind of effort and wrote you know five majestic volumes he took a engaged a farsi tutor from uh, uh, kashi if i'm not mistaken for about 6 months and then after 3 years he became as he became one of the acknowledged experts in the farsi language in india all right so this Giants. Is, this was a caliber he knew bengali of course english hindi uh sanskrit it's so inspirational just yeah, yeah. such high caliber them. so this was a minimum standard of the scholars of that new indian and this goes back to what we began with i mean yeah. to be a historian yeah any any from the kanari this is the minimum standard minimum standard as a very high standard arsi majumdar for example i mean he rubs shoulders with someone like sarkar <clears throat> not only did he write about uh, <clears throat> indian history he wrote two definitive volumes on the hindu kingdoms in southeast asia 
Champa, Cambodia, Thailand, Java, that. What, what is known as Greater India. They have still, you know, stood the test of time. So, like I said, you know, this was the minimum standard of uh, scholarship, not just in history, but in any other field. This was a minimum standard. And uh, as this was happening, the what you, you know, one of your questions uh, uh, earlier in this episode was uh, about uh, understanding or uh, discovering, rather rediscovering the real of history of India. That effort began in this era of New Indian Renaissance, which is why, you know, I had to get into that uh, in some detail. Understood. Now that effort, which began in the mid, uh, middle of the 19th century, it flowed beautifully like a river, like an unstoppable river for one century. But even as that was happening, a parallel development was also occurring. So we now have three streams. I mean, I'm simplifying it for easy understanding. The first stream was the what we call as a colonial uh, history writing. The second stream was the historical scholarship done by the luminaries of the New Indian Renaissance. Then the third stream roughly began in the 1930s. This stream of historical writing, it was imbued initially with ideological motives which later you know became rampant and acquired frightening levels of power and this stream of history writing generally began in two major places both are in Uttar Pradesh the first was in Aligarh the second was in Allahabad even today if you ask these uh, veteran uh, fossilized Marxists right they look back fondly on something called this Aligarh school of Indian history and Allahabad school of Indian history. So that movement began in, it was a movement, it was not scholarship. When you use the word movement, it has political undertones. Exactly. So which is, so there was an agenda. Yes. It was not the quest for truth. Yes. It was anything but a quest for truth. So this began uh, around the, roughly around the same period in Aligarh and Allahabad and those were the seeds on which a massive tree was built in the succeeding decades. And one of the prominent names of this ideological school of history writing was a man named Muhammad Habib. Who is, he is the father of Irfan, Irfan Habib. Habib. Okay. Yes. Okay. So this man first began the long term process or the long term project of whitewashing the crimes, the dark period, the violent excesses of Muslim rule in India, in medieval India. So Habib laid the foundations for this. So this was an individual motivation because of his allegiance to the same religion that he wanted to whitewash? Yes, it was an individual uh, uh, motivation, but it was, uh, it was, he was not alone in one sense. It was definitely his uh, individual uh, motivation, there is no doubt. And because of the allegiance to the religion? Yes, yes, absolutely. Now, what happened? Why did people like uh, Muhammad Habib emerge? This also has a slight uh, uh, historical context, which goes back all the way to the death of Aurangzeb, after which Mughal power in India completely collapsed and was eventually gobbled up by the East India Company. One major outcome of uh, the destruction of uh, Mughal power and uh, you know even by the even after Bahadur Shah Zafar died, one major outcome was the emergence of a class of Muslim elite primarily concentrated in western Uttar Pradesh you know which, which was the hub of Islamic power for centuries. So this class of Muslim elite is known as Ashraf and they had owed their allegiance to successive uh, Muslim uh, emperors. Now they were suddenly orphaned. 
they had no sultan to protect them and remember they they were the they were pretty much the lords of you know uh, cities as big as mumbai ashraf so western up were lording over mumbai no 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 they were lording over states which are as as big as mumbai and they had you know uh, when they felt that muslim political power can never return because these firangs have taken over and you know they have uh, pretty much made us irrelevant they found ways to uh, sustain not only their power but to sustain the dominance of islamic political power in india and they also had to contend with a resurgent hindu power in the form of marathas and maharaja ranjit singh and the rest of the uh, competing uh, uh, formations in that period now you have to make a detailed study of the fall of aurangzeb until 1857 to understand the full background of you know where i'm coming from where all this will lead to now this ashraf elite organized itself in many many uh, different ways uh, one of its members was a and they were well resourced yeah 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 uh, one of its most prominent members was an hardcore bigot named shah waliullah say it again shah waliullah shah waliullah uh, he began to write uh, you know feverish letters to all kinds of warlords in afghanistan asking them to invade uh, india it's par for the course in anyway. me these people this ashraf elite from western up at different points in time they formed different confeder- uh, confederacies and you know groupings just to Uh, somehow sustain their power rather the islamic political power in india under vastly changed circumstances and one of the generational outcomes of uh, this activity was the establishment of the aligarh muslim university and then you know which eventually led to the ra- uh, formation of something called the muslim league so let's say with this so uh, i think uh, like i began by saying that Uh, the academia was captured and even now there are some institutes we will we'll come to that uh, subsequently uh, which uh, uh, were hunting ground for the marxists mm. uh, and therefore they were able to influence generations mm. so the uh, the first such instance would be the infiltration or setup of amu aligarh muslim university mm. where through academia they tried to peddle their agenda and take control uh no you would can't, it, would amu you be no 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 and uh, that is historically incorrect okay amu hmm. was one of the offshoots and the outcomes of a long term project by this ashraf elite by the okay it was one of the by the ashraf elite okay. but muslim elite uh, in other parts of india amu was one of the insti- organized institutions a formal body formal institution uh, you know built with brick and mortar which would act as an organ to perpetuate the long term uh, muslim goal of islamizing all of india okay now there's a famous saying which basically says that pakistan after the formation of pakistan what remained of truncated india we are living in truncated bharatavarsha what remained in truncated india is a unfinished mughal dream so they still have this memory this this long term project in their that mind. someday we will complete yeah in their mind so aligarh was the concrete expression of this okay. it's one of them and perhaps the most prominent they used a university meaning education as a means of yeah i, I actually that was goal. meaning to say that, that yeah. education became a means of attaining that attaining goal that one of the organs like you said yes so that. somehow in my mind i see it as a precursor to the infiltration of academy on a larger scale that happened later not necessarily correlated but yeah no you are confusing two things uh, which did not occur in the period that you are talking about the marxists were nowhere on the scene when See, okay. so this was established. yeah this was led by this movement for this yeah. much later yeah, got when you look at the evolution and the trajectory of amu you find a new breed of muslim scholars who definitely owe their owed their allegiance to their religion number one but they were also trained in the western method but they kept their you know long term project islamization project alive and fashion and shape the, their own narrative 
as well as a national narrative according to you know the methods and tools uh, uh, that they acquired from the west and mohammad habib is very much a part of that not only that project but he is also a part of that elite which produced the AMU. so they actually had the best of tools and methods hmm. they had a long term vision yes, and ideology yes, of summarization yeah, yeah. And they were well versed with the Western yeah. modus operandi, mm. and therefore they were able to get it together to perpetuate. They fused it together, and uh, <clears throat> by the time Muhammad Habib became active in uh, uh, academia, roughly like I said, 1930s, he had to contend with all these brilliant minds. Jadunath Sarkar, you could not, you know, mess around with scholars of that stage. So he had to carve out his own uh, path, so to speak. And unlike today, you know, you could not just falsify history and get away with it. It was not only considered bad form, but it would end your career. There so was a penalty. And there was a huge cost. And one of the first things that Muhammad Habib did, which is still the template, both for uh, Islamic historians as well as for Marxists, he set the blueprint, which they still follow. I mean, there are several examples, but... I will give you a foundational uh, element of this uh, blueprint. A blueprint of this ingredient of this by 1930s, and after much of India's by then, you know, uh, Eliot and Dawson's volumes had come out. Uh, the history of India told by their uh, its own historians. These had come out, and uh, Islam's own record, circumstances, its Islamic political power was wiped out throughout the world, including in Turkey. The caliphate had been abolished in 1921. So, a lot of things had happened. What had also happened was that, along with the loss of political power on the global stage, history of Islam, the real history of Islam, from the primary sources, which were unearthed and, uh, you know, uh, written by Western scholarship, very accurate, factual, it gave Islam a bad name in India. Not just in India, but across the world. But across the world, it didn't match. You know, Islam's name did not matter that much because the West was ruling, largely thanks through their uh, advancements in science and technology and the kind of warfare that you know they had. It was unchallengeable in the world. You should read what Churchill, Winston Churchill, has written about Islam. It's very, it's eye-opening to see the list. Now. Habib, he saw that the history of the record of the Muslim rule in medieval uh, period was far from flattering. What he did was a deliberate project of somehow whitewashing this brutal record. So that was the intent. Yes. A classic example of his subterfuge was he's found in his biography of uh, uh, Mahmoud of Ghazni. For the first time, it was Muhammad Habib who writes that Mahmoud, his serial expeditions of uh, plunder and his industrial scale of temple destructions throughout you know, much of uh, India all the way till Somnath in Guj Gujarat, Habib writes that Mahmoud was motivated only by the lust for plunder and not at all by his allegiance to Islam. This is the first time anybody had written something like this about Mahmud. But it set the template for everything that followed. And not only that, Habib goes to the extent of writing, okay, I put it this way. We'll agree that, you know, Mahmud was, you know, he was motivated by a greed for loot. In which case, it makes him a dark one makes him a bandit and you know what he writes he counters Habib counters that who asked the Hindus to store so much of wealth in their temples because today or tomorrow they would be the feast for a greedy plunderer meaning Parag should not store any valuables or money for the fear cash, of a plunderer oh, for a fear of plunder so he legitimizes plunder, legitimizes legit plunder yes. just because a particular community has it yes. instead of questioning the plunderer. Correct. But more importantly, I think so the subterfuge was that he divorced his uh, yeah. brutal record, like you yeah. said, from the religion. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, because he, Mahmud, one problem for uh, Muhammad Habib was the fact that Mahmud himself says 
in you know when he breaks the jyotirlinga in somnath there's this famous conversation between the uh, uh, between the temple purohitas out there who say look you take all the money you want spare the lingam so he says mahmud says look there is something called a judgment day and allah will ask me why did you spare this jyotirlinga as a pious ghazi which means a servant or a warrior of islam so allah will ask me on judgment day you are not a true muslim because you spared this idol this unclean idol idol worship is prohibited in in, in yes. islam right so it has to be destroyed allah will ask me why did you spare this uh, 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 idol of the kafirs so therefore i do not want to be known as a trader of idols but a breaker of idols so that i may so be, that i better I rule this one i may be regarded as a pious ghazi so this kind of you know self declaration causes a problem to people like mohammed okay. rabi so how do they whitewash this they can't because if they accept that this is true then their an investigation will go that that investigation of mahmud will lead us to the books that islam considers as sacred people will start asking what is the meaning of ghazi what is the meaning of but paras what is the meaning of but shikan but means idol what is the meaning of uh, uh, you know judgment day qiyamah but this itself that when the conversation with the purohita that on the judgment day the uh, barometer for how pure you are towards the cause of the religion mm. itself reveals a lot about the religion it does precisely that's what so, i said no so it is to prevent the common reader from investigating you know further. these fundamental aspects that habib had to resort to skaldagiri so but again you evil genius asked him as a mere plunderer as opposed to brilliant. someone brilliant i would say brilliant yeah, yeah brilliant as opposed to someone who not only plundered but broke you know uh, things that other religions consider sacred revered and worshiped and yeah. so you re- recast him as a plunderer which is a lesser crime yeah, it takes away the religious yeah. aspect so altogether this even today is a template is a template ha which is seen we, we seeing. see a dozens yeah. of article yeah. son of a headmaster yeah. i'm yeah. saying son of a headmaster you know <clears throat> show me <clears throat> true islam does not uh, teach us uh, to disrespect other religions true islam does not uh, ask its believers to break temples and demolish uh, vigrahas you know, this narrative which so the template has worked for years it has worked for years not years decades, decades almost for a century this is what muhammad had been did <coughs> alongside <coughs> marxism was also slowly making inroads in the academia and especially in the so called alhabad school one group the early marxist marxist uh, uh, ideologues who became history teachers and history scholars allegedly they recasted the islamic history of india in economic terms now plunder is different you know to prevent uh, uh, them from examining the religious motive of islamic invaders now these fellows took it a step forward meaning they shifted the goal post and recast the whole uh, history of the medieval muslim period in economic terms meaning invasions were justified a uh, large scale plunder loot temple demolitions slave taking rape all these were justified using an alleged economic lens by giving a simple formula exploiter versus exploited oppressor versus oppressed and this allegedly the so called recasting allegedly was not limited only to islamic invaders but even hindu kings did the same so you do this monkey balancing draw a false equivalence where none existed and false equivalence again the template again, continues again, to today yeah yeah okay and then, so that's how it started that brought you know uh, new spurious narratives now if you have to justify this so called exploited versus uh, you know exploiter what explains industrial scale conversions of hindus fine you 
defeating your enemy in normal course of war is one thing forcible conversion what explains that yeah, goes beyond so that. that is to explain that this these theories were evolved false equivalences were evolved that you know conversions were not forcible because islam stands for universal brotherhood the exploited uh, tabooed lower caste hindus saw islam and these invaders as their liberators as their deliverers and therefore they willingly, willingly, embrace. willingly embrace islam how clever well, the truth <clears throat> continues right the truth yeah. continues so you study the currents of the history establishment in the 1930s that is where the origins of much of damage you can find from the 1930s onwards these three streams like i mentioned in history they continued on parallel tracks but the scene changed dramatically after india attained independence and like i said in the previous episodes all roads lead to nawab nehru so on that note on that note uh, uh, i think uh, this becomes a good segue for the next conversation yes yes absolutely that the advent of marxist or the uh, or the uh, rise of marxist parallel to the aligarh school so to speak and habib showing the template which was later imbibed by uh, these marxists which successfully was perpetuated i mean till this morning in a sense has been perpetuated in this yes. morning so uh, what i would also like to touch upon in the next conversation as a continuation of this is while habib had his motivations hmm. uh, to whitewash uh, the brutality of islam and marxists had their own motivations barring the likes of say jaduna sarkar why wasn't there a third group mm. of uh, high caliber people some of them you referred to mm. who equally put their foot forward in trying to neutralize it at that stage itself which got neutralized subsequently thanks to works of many people only in the last uh, several years mm. but till then a lot of this history was fed to us so why did this group not emerge at that point of time before no, marxists could take root no uh, para you're slightly confusing the issue here hmm. the objective truthful history writing you know hmm. truthful meaning remember history is a quest for truth hmm. in that sense they were already there majumdar jadunath sarkar all these people are already there yeah but these people acquired i mean they, they control narratives later that is what i'm saying so we'll cover that we'll get into that in the next episode, episode. Yeah. fair this this was the mainstream history these fellows were in the fringes yeah, yeah. So how subterfuge became mainstream ah, is they, what we'll discuss they were in the fringes and uh, just to you know clarify your point uh, in a more uh, succinct way stalwarts i mentioned them you know stalwarts of new indian renaissance they did not suspect the ideology and motivation of these people okay. like habib they they accorded equal status as to to habib and gang they accorded equal respects to them as genuine historians without realizing the underlying without motive without realizing the underlying motivation so it was al taqiyah to some extent at play not to some extent to a great extent okay interesting so those aspects will cover so the they in their in their in their evolved sense gave uh, gave them their due no, Allah. gave they accorded them respect. respect they thought these people were writing truthful history history not not uh, they they, L- they little knowing they never suspected that you know they were doing something else in the name of history okay so that is that kind of that explains it yeah. that explains it with this we conclude part 1 of the multi part series of history that we started with sandeep as you would realize as you hear all that uh, was uncovered in the course of the conversation history is philosophy in action and the eternal pursuit of truth the absolute truth and how over time with the advent of uh, the likes of mohammed habib and the parallel emergence of the marxist uh, 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 sex so to speak how the seeds were sown for what uh, was to come a subterfuge later that we all consumed so at this juncture what is important to understand from what sandeep said is the evolved pers- indic perspective or uh, itihasa as sandeep uh, explained uh, including the etymology versus what it was reduced to with each passing uh, uh, century and how eventually we will come to the conversation in the next part 
as to where did this go from here with the advent of Habib, with the, uh, with the rise of the Marxists, what happened next? Do watch that uh, part of the conversation in the uh, second part of this uh, series on history. In the meantime, we would urge you to like, subscribe and share uh, the channel Dharma Dispatch for an authentic version again of the eternal pursuit of truth that Sandeep has devoted his life to so that more and more people come to know how we were uh, subsumed by the content that was not genuinely well intended and it created, a, like I said in the beginning, rendered us generation after generation with the subjugation complex. It's important that this comes to light and we are trying to do that. So thank you all for watching and we look forward to you in the next part.